In this video, we've got a double helping of NES books. Together, these make up the NES Omnibus. Are you ready for a deep dive into Nintendo nostalgia? Let's press start to begin this review. Hey everyone, John here. It's time to add another book. Actually, two to the massive and growing stack of encyclopedias on the libraries of classic game consoles. Published by Schiffer Publishing and written by Brett Weiss, today we have both volumes of the NES Omnibus. Before we get into it, if you are interested in video game book reviews, be sure to hit that subscribe button and give this video a like if it's of any interest to you. Either way, or if you do both, it will really help to keep these videos coming. In an earlier video, I reviewed the SNES Omnibus, and then I compared it to three other Super NES encyclopedias, and then compared them all again against each other, so you would have seen his work on my channel before. Like the anthology series from Geeksline Publishing, Brett Weiss's Omnibus series also goes backwards through time by looking at the 16-bit Super NES before the 8-bit NES. I don't know if these NES books are intending to compete, but because of their content and proximity of their releases, they are, and so I will likely do a comparison video of these and other NES books that have come out in only the last few years. For now, we'll just focus on just this, the NES Omnibus. Though the first volume came out a year earlier, I want to hold off until reviewing it until both volumes were widely available physically, which they are as of now. It would be silly to have only one, and not both, as they each cover about half of the NES library. Both of these books are quite hefty, and have 424 large pages each. The first covers games that begin with a number, and A to L, and the second covers M to Z, with appendices for games outside of North America. Besides the 677 officially licensed North American cartridges, these books also include 84 unlicensed games and Nintendo World Championships 1990. The licensed games include compilation cartridges and alternate versions, which each get their own review. For example, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out's three-page review and Punch-Out's one-page review are separate, and Donkey Kong Classics is on a page apart of the two games that it includes. No official North American game is technically missing, though when I talk about the errors later, and you know I will, I will explain how the books seem to be confused about a couple games' license status. It doesn't change the fact that those games are still being covered, so we can forgive that. And then, indeed, all the officially licensed games are here. There are also 84 unlicensed games. Other NES books that do cover them have different unlicensed games or more of them, and I'm no expert on them enough to be able to definitively say if every unlicensed game released specifically in North America is indeed covered here, but these certainly have all the ones from the well-known developers, including Tengen with his black cartridges and Color Dreams, who later became the Wisdom Tree and focus on Christian video games. Along with the competition cartridge, Nintendo World Championships 1990, that's 762 main size reviews. Then at the end of Volume 2, there are three appendices with quick looks at additional cartridges. Appendix 1 briefly covers 34 PAL region exclusives with just a single short paragraph and no images. Sorry PAL, this is all you get European exclusives. Appendix 2 quickly looks at 10 home entertainment suppliers games that were only released in Australia. Appendix 3 touches on three miscellaneous games, including the Hong Kong NES version of Mahjong, Racermate Challenge 2 for a bicycle training system, and Nintendo Campus Challenge 1991, a competition cartridge of which there was only one copy of in existence. True to the NES Omnibus's name, it's strictly about the NES, and so it doesn't include games exclusively for the NES's Japanese counterparts, the Famicom or the Famicom Disk System. This gives us a grand total of 809 games featured in the NES Omnibus. Like I said, we'll see in detail in a later video how this compares to the other NES books, but I can safely say that at least from a North American perspective, there are no noteworthy omissions, most certainly not for the officially licensed games. If you can think of a normal NES game, it is in these 848 pages. The majority of the games examined in the main section each fit neatly on a single page, and I like that about the Omnibus books, that every game, even those that are generic or unmemorable, will have at least a page to itself. 36 more noteworthy games get two pages. We've got a fair number of classics here. But of unusual note, Chiller is the only unlicensed game to get this two-page treatment. There's a lengthy insider insight about Swamp Thing, which is also sort of a surprise. Four truly iconic games have three pages, and just one, The Legend of Zelda, earns a whopping four pages, mostly due to seven insider insights, as this game has definitely made its way into many gamers' hearts. Brett Weiss must have something against the number three. The first two Castlevanias get two pages, but Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse gets only one. Same with Ninja Gaiden and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where the third game doesn't get as much attention. Mega Man 3 as well, which is funny since 4 also gets two pages like the first two. And Super Mario Bros. 3, arguably the most popular NES game ever, does get two pages, but that's still one less than the three that the original and Super Mario Bros. 2 each get. 
The only third part that gets more honor than the other games is Ultima Exodus. But then again, it is because the first two Ultima games aren't here. Plus, it doesn't actually have the number three in its title, and it's technically the first of the three Ultima games that are on the NES. Brett Weiss apparently hates the number three more than Valve does. This is the observational overanalysis that you get on this channel. Okay, but what have we got here on these pages? If you've seen the SNES Omnibus, then you already see that the format is the same. These pages are larger than most other books that you've seen me review, so there's lots here for each game. We've got the title of the game at the top, and a box of the usual vital stats, including the publisher, the developer, the game type, which includes the genre or style and number of players, and then the North American release year. Fairly standard but essential details. In the upper left, we almost always start off with a box shot. There are exceptions, like the games that only came packaged with the NES in a bundle, and therefore had no individual box, in which case the cartridge is used instead. There are a handful of other images. For the single page overviews, there are usually three or four screenshots, with one of them almost always being a title screenshot. Other images may include the back of the box, which is often too small to make all the details on it, or the cartridge, which can be redundant when the label is the same as the box front. There are exceptions, like the periodic table of abbreviations on Shingen the Ruler. Yikes. Images can also include an ad of the game, like what you might have seen in gaming magazines at the time. Compared to the SNES Omnibus, which had many of these ads, there seem to be fewer ads in the NES Omnibus. Other related images are possible, such as this photo on the page of Pesterminator, the Western Exterminator. There is a lot of text overall, but the main overview portion is very concise, probably due to Brett Weiss being a professional writer for about 25 years. The reason why I may call these overviews is that they don't really review the game. Sure, sometimes there's a little bit of stuff that sounds subjective, but for the most part, it's a description of the game, and he goes into depth with actual game detail more than in a typical review, often thoroughly listing characters, bosses, stages, and items, or game modes. There may be some comparisons to other versions of the game on competing platforms as well. The packed overview itself is only a small part of the overall text, with the rest including at least one of, or a combination of, memories, notable quotables, and or insider insights. Memories are usually other quick yet personal thoughts that Brett Weiss has about that game. Some of them are intriguing, like the time he sold the ultra rare stadium events for only $5. Yikes. Notable quotables are usually excerpts from reviews, whether from magazines at the time or more recent publications, either in print or online. Insider insights are usually stories about experiences with or involving that game told by somebody in the gaming industry. Interestingly, for the Battle of Olympus, one of the programmers and co-designers of the game, Yukio Horimoto isn't considered an insider, so it gets a notable quotable. And yet, an insider insight here is from Chris Randazzo, host of the Stone Age Gamer podcast, who starts by saying he only played 10 minutes of the game. Guy who made the game. Just notable. Guy who only played 10 minutes of that game. Insider, apparently. So insider just refers to someone in the industry in general, not someone involved with that particular game. In any case, the notable quotables and insider insights are nostalgic or amusing, often both, though at times they can sound very similar to each other. Strangely, some of them even contradict one another, which I'll talk about later. There can be, and often are, multiple notable quotables and or insider insights, so along with a different number and types of images, there are many possible combinations of how these pages are filled up. Though these two books are almost entirely comprised of overviews of NES cartridges, there are a few other little things here. The first volume begins with a nostalgia fueled forward by Adam F. Goldberg, creator of The Goldbergs. No way! Yes way! It was the Nintendo Power Glove. And writer and producer of numerous things that you may have seen. And an informative preface by Brett Weiss, which gets into some history to set the stage for the NES era. Volume 1 ends with a couple articles. One about the infamous Power Glove, written by Zoe K. Howard. Yes, way. It was the Nintendo Power Glove. And another about NES games, based on comic books, by Blair Farrell. Similarly, the second volume has a foreword about why the NES is the best games console of all time, written by my friend and Nintendo Quest director Rob McCallum. And Brett Weiss's preface here talks about how the NES Omnibus came to be. At the end, we see that everything that Shane Stein needed to know he learned from the NES, according to his write-up of the worldly education he got from the NES in a pre-internet age, and Patrick Hickey Jr. writes about the sports games of the NES. And then, close to the middle of each volume, is some nice art by Thor Thorvaldsen Jr., also known as Thormeister on DeviantArt. The first volume shows artwork based on Super Mario Bros. 2, no doubt a popular NES game, but kind of odd since the overview of that game is in the second volume. That one has a nice group shot of many of the NES's most celebrated heroes. Well, I don't know if Kazumi the Mermaid from Schoon or a Tiki Man from Town & Country Surf Designs are really considered iconic, but I was able to name everybody else instantly. 
How many do you know? So this is the NES Omnibus. Now, let's get into the great and not so great bits. Great bits. Some of the things I like about the NES Omnibus are exactly the same as those for the Super NES Omnibus. I appreciate that every cartridge gets one full page of coverage at minimum. In other books, a full page might be the maximum. Why well, sure had some dedication to get enough images and information for even the simplest or most generic games to fill these pages that are already larger than in other publications. Those books might just allocate a fraction of a page to them and move on. Books can be costly to make, and with most game libraries, there are several hundred games to cover, so it's probably tempting to just write only a sentence or two and move on. But not here in the Omnibus books, where every game gets at least a whole page to shine. There are still standout, iconic games that get more coverage, with some games getting two or three pages, or four in the specific case of Zelda. But still, those are all whole numbers, with no fractional pages here. This keeps the layout simple, contributing to the clean and uncluttered look, though it does mean lots of pages. This also justifies the NES Omnibus being in two volumes. As impressive as an 840 page book would be, it is more practical to be split into two. These write-ups I call overviews as opposed to reviews, because reviews, by my definition, would have a numerical score, or a star rating, or icons, or some clear indication of whether or not something is recommended. While the text here can still be subjective, including praise and criticism, for the most part, it is describing in-game details, like listing characters and stages. Specific details will be scrutinized in the not-so-great bits section later, but overall, the text does its purpose. So if you are not familiar with a particular game, you can learn about it fairly quickly here, with more specifics than in other books of this type. The writing is concise, as one should expect from Brett Weiss, who has been writing professionally since 1997. While not totally free from spelling errors, I have certainly seen a lot worse. Insider insights include intriguing anecdotes, and you know they're going to be good when they are the reason a game gets two pages. Christopher Pico's story about winning a contest to beta test the Mad Max game is fascinating, even though it was clearly frustrating for him to live through that. Crystal Tiedemann, a fan of Swamp Thing, recalls her experience with the NES game in a detailed and nostalgic account. There are a few times when the insider doesn't know what they are talking about, which I will get to soon enough. But when they do, their insight is often more interesting than the actual overview because there's a narrative, sometimes with emotion to it. Here's a minor improvement. The SNES Omnibus and the first volume of the NES Omnibus have this design choice where the box art is sometimes wider than the first column's width, which disturbs the second column. Volume 2 of the NES Omnibus has a better layout by ensuring that the box art now takes up the same width as the text. This may be really subtle, but I notice and appreciate the change. Thor Thorfinnsson Jr.'s artwork is great as before. Who wouldn't want posters with his art? If you've seen his art like on his DeviantArt page, you know he's very familiar with video games and likes to do large groups of characters, so this is very much his thing. Unlike the SNES Omnibus, where it complained about the covers being too similar by featuring the same controller on each volume, here there are two different controllers, with the standard rectangular controller for Volume 1 and the ergonomic controller for the redesigned NES for Volume 2. Despite being an NES fan since, well, the NES days, I literally did not hold a dogbone controller until I bought one very recently on eBay, and besides for collection purposes after the fact, it was primarily just a show in this video. Nothing wrong with the decision to feature this for the cover, since it is also a default controller, but since the controller came so late, it's not as recognizable, and so I wonder if something like the NES Advantage might be more iconic. In any case, I'm glad the covers are a bit more different. Also unlike the SNES Omnibus, which had missed out on two soccer games, or three if we include the South American Supercopa, there are no officially licensed games missing here this time. Plus, the NES Omnibus briefly looks at exclusive games from PAL regions, so it puts the Omni in Omnibus as it actually covers it all, even if just barely. The Super NES only has one unlicensed game from its natural lifespan, but the NES has 84 unlicensed games, or at least that's how many are looked at here. So if you're a fan of unlicensed games, you should be glad to know they are treated just as equally as licensed games. Weiss also correctly identifies that Miss Pac-Man and Tetris are different games between their unlicensed Tengen releases and the official games with the same name. From here we transition to the not-so-great bits. Not-so-great bits. I'm always talking about licensed games versus unlicensed games. The distinction is important, especially for collectors. Some books choose to put unlicensed games in a separate section, while other books integrate them. The NES Omnibus does include and integrate them, though it mentions in the text whenever a game is unlicensed. But unfortunately, as I hinted at, it does have a couple of errors. I've mentioned in previous videos about the complicated situation with Tengen games. One of those complications is that some of these have actually seen licensed versions. I'm not talking about Miss Pac-Man and Tetris, which I already mentioned are different. I mean identical releases between the black unlicensed cartridge and the official grey cartridge, including Gauntlet and RBI Baseball. And there are two more, which is where the issues are. 
Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is one of those games that got both an unlicensed release by Tengen, as well as an official release. However, it's by Mindscape. This is indeed explained in the overview. But that page shows the box art and cartridge of the unlicensed Tengen release instead of the licensed Mindscape version in which the art is horizontally flipped and on a standard grey cartridge. I feel like the licensed box art really should have taken precedence. Or perhaps he just went with the first release, in which case it's not actually wrong. However, this is similar to Pac-Man, where an inconsistency appears. Pac-Man, other than a box and tiny differences on a title screen, is an identical game between its Tengen and Namco releases, and each of them gets a separate entry, unlike the Tengen and Mindscape releases of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. In short, for consistency, there should have been another entry for Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, so that there is one for each publisher. Or there should be just one entry for Pac-Man, instead of unnecessarily having two entries. And yes, it would be fine to have just one entry for Pac-Man, even if the NES Omnibus had realized that Pac-Man actually has three NES versions total, not two, because besides the later Namco release, the Tengen published one came in both licensed and unlicensed forms, and though the box art shown here is of the licensed one, the text mistakenly says the Tengen one is only unlicensed. It even says, of course the Tengen box and cart lack the Nintendo seal of approval but literally just above it is the Tengen box with the seal of approval. Though this box is for the grey licensed version, the image next to it is for the black unlicensed version, so this mismatch could be considered another inconsistency. Here are some more issues regarding box art. The pages for Bionic Commando and Metal Gear have the European versions, and though more subtle, so does WWF WrestleMania Steel Cage Challenge, even though it's just a bit of text that makes that difference. Scans online for the box of the unlicensed Blackjack sometimes have this person's face plastered over this guy, probably as a joke or something, and unfortunately, this book has the altered version. The Fantastic Adventures of Dizzy has the Aladdin Compact cartridge version of the box art, but the box art for the full-size cartridge should have been used for consistency. Line of Spacehead's Cosmic Crusade, Quattro Adventure, and Quattro Sports are also of the Aladdin versions, though that is really a minor difference. Paraticus Conflict has his NT72 label on it, but I had no trouble finding scans online without it, and the backs of the boxes are usually too small to read the text or make out the screenshots. On that topic, any game encyclopedia has a challenge of finding good screenshots to represent the game being featured. Even without looking at the acknowledgement section, I could tell many of these screenshots, if not all, then certainly most, are from mobygames.com. Nothing wrong with getting screenshots from an online source. However, most of these screenshots are of early areas and don't show much variety of the game's experiences, and are often too similar to each other. Egregiously, the shots being selected to be in print don't take into account what other images are being used. For example, let's look at Blaster Master. Such a great game, with many different locations, two distinct gameplay styles, and cool looking bosses, so I'm especially hard on the screenshot choices with this game. Look, we have the Area 8 boss on the cover. The overviews in the NES Omnibus may include an image of the cartridge, which usually has the same art as the box, so that's redundant, but fine, that's the boss again. Then we have a magazine ad, and you know I like ads being reprinted in general, as they remind me of old game magazines, and so there's nostalgia and old school charm. But this ad features a close-up of the same boss. Given that this is already packed full with a couple insider insights, why would you waste the remaining limited space on a screenshot of the same boss yet again? That's four times seeing the same thing. Oh, but that's not all. The back of the box is here, and the central screenshot shows this room. The same room is in the ad. So why would one of the hand-picked screenshots be the same room for a third time? The baffling obsession of this room goes beyond this particular publication. If you've seen my review of another NES book, the NES Anthology, at about 25 minutes and 18 seconds into that video, you will see that Blaster Master has an unusual curse around this one room that we keep seeing, as it shows up twice there too. Okay, we're not comparing all the NES books against each other just yet. But what is up with this room, honestly? While I was editing this video, I happened to be on eBay looking for a second copy of Blaster Master. No word of a lie, the top result chose to use the screenshot, and it's the same room again. Why? We have complete maps of this game over at my website, vgmaps.com, the video game atlas, mapped by Crystal Jacobs and Sony Ball, both unmarked and marked. So take a look, and you let me know in the comments why everybody is so fascinated with this room compared to literally anywhere else that we need multiple shots of it. Like, of all the various biomes in this world, we like the one with plain old trees in it? Yo! Check out my new shirt, John! What do you think? Are you kidding me?! Three or four times isn't even the most. How many times do you want to see Hulk Hogan rip his shirt off? How about six times, all for WWF WrestleMania? I don't mean all the WWF games, just that one. Here are some more questionable screenshot choices. Nintendo World Cup mentions six field types. 
but only the grass feud is shown in all these images. The notable quotable for Friday the 13th specifically says, all the counselors look markedly different from one another, yet all three gameplay shots show only Laura. Fazanadu's three shots have the character with the same equipment, and the amount of experience and gold are very close. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 has a variety of enemies, but its two screen caps show the same number of the same enemy, three rock soldiers. The Legacy of the Wizard is about a whole family, five members of it being playable, yet all three screenshots show only the daughter, Lil. Show the other family members. Why not Pochi, their pet monster? Ultimate Stuntman is described to have many genres, but not all of them are shown here, such as the bomb disposal, horizontally scrolling flying, or vehicles other than the car, and showing any of these would be better than having two identical screenshots. Even if we forgive the far from optimal screenshots, since they're more like missed opportunities than actual mistakes, we can't give these books a pass for screenshots for the wrong game. AD&D Heroes of the Lands has a shot from AD&D Hillsfar. Captain Comic has a shot that belongs to Captain Planet. Here's a funny one, Ninja Crusaders is called a Ninja Gaiden clone, debate that if you like, but then includes a screenshot of Ninja Gaiden 2. Super Mario Bros. and Super Mario Bros. 2 have the same problems as the NES anthology. The first game has way too many dark areas, and the second game mostly focuses on World 1. Show some variety! And Super Mario Bros. 3, the biggest and most hyped up NES game of all time, only gets extremely tiny screenshots? Wow. Adding insult to injury, because as mentioned, it doesn't even get three pages like the earlier two games do. Besides ranting about screenshots, another thing that is now a staple of my reviews is when I point out some factual errors that I find in these books. Both volumes of the NES Omnibus are among the most wordiest of the various NES books, when you include the notable quotables and in Insider Insights. And with these overviews in particular, there is lots of specific gameplay detail, so there is more potential for inaccuracy, which anyone familiar with a particular game might pick up on, and that potential is realized, as there are a considerable number of these errors. I'm not going to go through every one that I found, as many are minor, but I can't help but point out the blatant ones that truly stand out. Early on, we have the unlicensed compilation cartridge, Action 52. It is a collection of 52 games, but that term is debatable, as these games are shoddy, buggy experiences. But even being so bad, the games are mostly unmemorable, except for one particular game. You know the one. Everyone who knows Action 52 has heard of this one game, the one that even got a standalone sequel. That's right, it's Cheetah Men! Cheetah Men, of course! Any mention of Action 52 would absolutely bring up the Cheetah Men. Yes siree! Hey, what about you guys? Oh yeah, we're in there too. The Cheetah Man. Yes, but that's another story. Well, there's actually not much said in the main overview portion before spending the rest of it just listing the 52 games, but then at least we'd surely see it listed. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, 52 games are indeed listed, but not the Cheetah Men! Wow, that's great. Active Enterprise's flagship game. Totally ignored. Imagine talking about Nintendo and never mentioning Mario. It's like that. But wait, if Cheetah Men isn't listed, how are there still 52 games listed here? Weiss had apparently researched the prototype version, which doesn't actually have the Cheetah Men game, but a different last game, the Action Gamer, which is reported here as the Action Gamester. To still be incorrect, even if you meant to refer to the prototype. There is a Cheetah Man in the title screenshot, which is here, which, by the way, is only from the final version, and which a notable quotable actually made note of, but that's it. Wow. Flip ahead 127 pages and get to the sequel, Cheetah Man 2, which got its own cartridge. The very first sentence of this overview seems silly, as it begins to describe it as the sequel to Cheetah Man, which only appeared on the multi-game cartridge Action 52, which should have tipped him off that maybe it should have actually been mentioned in the Action 52 overview. Speaking of animal men, let's take a look at the robot masters that Mega Man is up against in Mega Man 2. There are nearly a hundred robot masters across a dozen games in the main and classic series of Mega Man. We're not even talking about the X-Series or Battle Network or anything. You could be forgiven for messing up the names of one of them, as there are so many of these Robot Masters. But not for Mega Man 2. Mega Man 2 is the most popular and favorite Mega Man game of many, easily far and above all the others. So if any Robot Master could be forgotten, it can't be one of these eight, right? Look, two of them even rhyme. Flashman or Crashman? Do you think they hang out more because they rhyme? <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, there it is. Fishman. Fishman? No! It's Flashman! You know, rhymes with Crashman! Everyone knows Flashman! Heftyman, Thanosman. Okay, maybe not my friends, but for anyone who knows Mega Man at all, they all should! No excuse! Okay, maybe that's being dramatic for what might have been a typo. But is it a mere typo? Here's something that my brother pointed out. Thanks, Jason. You're welcome. In Mega Man 2's credits, look at the very last person to be named. Wow, it's Fishman! Not somewhere in the middle, but right at the very, very end. 
So Fishman is here. Thanks to my brother Jason for pointing this out. But what does it mean? Was Brett Weiss somehow influenced by this name at the end of the game? Why would he refer to the credits anyway though? Is it just an incredible coincidence? By failing to mention the Cheetah Man, did he subconsciously have to come up with another Animal Man to compensate? Brett Weiss isn't the only one who gets confused about Animal Man. Super Mario Bros. 3 has insider Kale Mangas mentioning the McDonald's Happy Meal toys. The spring-loaded Tanuki Mario is among the ones he remembered the most. Tanuki Mario. Except it's not a spring-loaded Tanuki Mario, it's a spring-loaded Raccoon Mario. Everyone knows Raccoon Mario. He's the only thing on the cover of the most hyped-up NES game of all time. Super Mario Brothers 3! There's not even a distracting background, like in the superior Japanese version. So everyone should recognize this. I might have let it slide, but he said he remembered it the most, when he clearly misremembered it. Okay, maybe I still would have called him out on it, since this is literally one of the most iconic power-ups of video games ever. And then Tiny Toon Adventures 2 mentions Hampton Hog, but his name is Hampton J. Pig, which Weiss does correctly have in Tiny Toon Adventures Cartoon Workshop, so the inconsistency is baffling. Similarly, he wrote Wily Coyote for the Bugs Bunny Crazy Castle, but it should be Wile E. Coyote, like how he has it in the Roadrunner overview. Alright, now I'm splitting hairs, but I figured I could stretch out this weird error streak that involves animals. Here's one that has nothing to do with animals that really baffled me. Mark Friedman from GameCola.net says, regarding Totally Rad, you can only charge when standing still. Let's see now. What is he talking about? Let's try the European version. Now the Japanese version called Magic John. Yep, I can still charge while running. Again, this would have been easy to brush off except he spent half the paragraph talking about this. He even admitted that he was nitpicking, but if you're going to nitpick, shouldn't you make sure that you were totally right first? Like, come on! I guess insider insights and notable quotables are across the spectrum of accuracy, or perhaps perception. There are times when they even contradict. Sure, some could be a matter of opinion. One is quoted saying that the best Wheel of Fortune game is the one featuring Vanna White, but an insider considers this their least favorite. Other times you wonder if they played the same game. One person says Star Force has sheer speed, while the other says it is slow. I actually could go on and on about various specific errors. Yes, really. But I'll stop here or you might think these books are inaccurate. They really aren't. It's just easier to talk about the things that are incorrect than the things that are correct. Despite the disproportionate discussion on a dozen distracting deviations, the NES Omnibus is still a solid source of information for NES games, especially North American games, and including unlicensed games. Just don't take every word as gospel. It's not absolutely accurate, but we can still appreciate the deep detail and the amusing anecdotes, which make for quick and easy reading, of individual entries at least, so it's a handy offline reference, including nostalgia. The screenshot selection is where it is weak, as it shouldn't be that hard to get a more representative sample of images. It is jarring when the text goes to such lengths such as listing all the characters and stages, but then the screen captures are more limited in scope by, for example, showing only one character in early stages. The professional writing and a clean layout keep this on the higher end of the scale. So just like the SNES Omnibus before it, the NES Omnibus by Brett Weiss gets a 4 out of 5. You can buy it from brettweisswords.com if you'd like the book signed by Brett Weiss himself. Or you can find the NES Omnibus on Amazon, and as it is a wide release, it should also be available in many other places that books are sold. Its regular price is $49.99 per book, but you really need both, so be ready to put down 100. Just like I did with the books of the Super NES, I plan to pit all the various NES books against each other, and we'll see how this really fares. So stay tuned, consider subscribing so you don't miss out. So what do you think? Does Brett Weiss's double dose of Nintendo nostalgia sound like something you would delve into? Let me know in the comments below if you have any anecdotes around your favorite NES games. And if you know what makes this room in Blaster Master so endearing to many, please, please let me know in the comments. Until next time, keep playing, keep reading, and keep geeking out. See ya!